Good evening. I'm Dr. Vincent Baycoat, the director of the Wheaton College Center for Applied Christian Ethics. Welcome to our next to the last event of the year. We have one more event uh, next Monday. Our theme this year is entitled Embody. It's about embodiment, thinking about being in these bodies, which makes tonight's topic quite apt. So tonight we have the privilege of having Dr. Tim Johnson here. Dr. Johnson is probably familiar to many of you. You've seen his face uh, on Good Morning America and other ABC reports. He's the senior medical correspondent for ABC News. And tonight he's talking about his book, The Truth About Getting Sick in America. So he has a lot of interesting things to say uh, about healthcare. Uh, after he's done, uh, there are two microphones right there for you to raise your questions. Uh, just one simple request that I have with your questions. I mean, it's fine to introduce your question with a few introductory statements, but please make your questions questions, please. That's always something that uh, I think we, it, it makes for the best kind of conversation this evening. So, and after, and after we've had the Q&A for a while, Dr. Johnson will be signing his book uh, out front. So, please join me. Welcome, Dr. Tim Johnson. Thank you very much. Uh, we got the microphone. Can you hear in the back? It's carrying. If, it, if you don't hear, raise your hand and we'll, we'll step it up. I'm pleased to be back on this campus after we were trying to figure it out. Probably in the mid to late 80s was the last time I was here with C. Everett Coop when he was Surgeon General. We did a dialogue together on this campus. And I'm looking forward to seeing the new science building tomorrow and being in some classes. But I have become passionate about the subject of health care reform. Most of my time at ABC after I became full-time with ABC News in 1984 was reporting on clinical developments, new tests, new treatments. But in the last roughly five years, I have become increasingly aware of the fact that when it comes to the health of this nation, what we do about health care delivery and financing is going to be just as important, if not more important, than any scientific discoveries we might come come across. So I've been spending a lot of time reading, thinking, talking to experts, doing a lot of interviews. I've tried to put my thoughts together in a different way for the general public about the kinds of things that we at least have to think about and be aware of if we're going to do sensible health care reform in this country. And that's what I'm going to try to present to you in short form tonight. So in this book, there are five chapters of the way I organize this in terms of my own thinking. The big question, the big problem, the big fear, the big sermon. I am also an ordained minister, so I'll sneak in at least a little sermon tonight. <laughs> and finally, the big prediction. So let me start with the big question, which is, this is a question that really ought to haunt all of us as Americans. It ought to hang over any discussion about health care in this country. And the question is, why does the United States spend more than twice as much per person as the average per person costs of all other industrialized countries. And we're still the only one that doesn't have universal health care. Think about that now again. We spend almost, we spend now over $8,000 per person in this country every year on health care. The average per person costs of all other developed countries, you lump them together, Japan, Switzerland, Germany, Sweden, England, all of them together, it's about $4,000. The outcomes are virtually the same as I'll show you in a minute. And yet, we're the only one that doesn't have universal health care. That ought to make us think, how are we spending our money? What's, there's something wrong with that picture. Uh, if we're spending that much and we don't cover everybody and the outcomes are about the same. So let me just show you a few little figures here. This, this is a couple years ago now. But if you look at this number, you'll see here, here we were then 7,500 now. As I said, we're over 8,000. Then the average was 3,000. It's now about 4,000. So we're by far and away the biggest spender. Uh, and then you say, well, if we live twice as long, I guess it, you could justify that cost, but of course we don't. In fact, among the top five spenders, we have the lowest life expectancy. Uh, it's now about 79 years, not much difference, but certainly not twice as long. And if you look at outcomes, more importantly, we're virtually the same overall as all these other industrialized countries. I'm going to show you one set of data because it's one we often talk about in discussion, namely comparisons with Canada. So, what I did is I got the numbers from the Canadian Cancer Society for five-year survivals. 
and I got the numbers from the American Cancer Society, and I put them side by side. And as you can see, uh, the U.S. does a little better in some cancers here, Canada does a little better in some cancers here, and we're tied virtually in a couple, but overall very much in the same ballpark, even though we spend twice as much per person. Think about that. Now, there's no question Canadians wait longer for many tests and even treatments, uh, but the outcomes, you know, what really counts in the long run, the five-year survival rates in this case, are virtually the same. And that's true of all of these other industrialized countries. Here's some numbers that are even more startling and, to me, disturbing. So these are numbers from the famous Dartmouth studies about Medicare spending. And this is from an article in 2010. The numbers are very much the same. If you look at Miami, Medicare patients living in Miami cost about $15,000 per year. Look at Salem, Oregon, $5,000 per year, one-third. Outcomes in those two cities, the same. How is it that you spend three times as much for Medicare patients in Miami as in Salem, Oregon? Now, and that, by the way, is taking into account cost of living differences. So that's not the factor. Well, if we're really honest about it, what happens is you get a lot of old people there in Miami, Florida, and the medical establishment starts taking advantage, doing a lot of tests, a lot of procedures, runs up the bills, no difference in outcomes. So what I'm saying to all of us is that we have got to start thinking about how we spend money on health care in this country. Almost all, here's a number that's going to blow your mind if you haven't heard it. Almost all health economists of all political persuasions, conservative and liberal, estimate that about a third of what we spend on health care in this country that's a third of $2.67 trillion is the word they almost always use is unnecessary. Now that includes outright fraud and there's a, some fraud in Medicare especially, we all know that, but that's a relatively small amount. So they're telling us, these people who study this for a living, that somewhere between eight and $900 billion a year of our healthcare expenditure is unnecessary in the sense that there's no real proof that it makes any difference in the outcomes. And I'll tell you, when my eyes were really open to this phenomenon uh, for the first time, and it just kind of stunned me when it happened. Back in the 1990s, some of you with grayer hair will maybe remember this, some leading experts in this country started to promote the idea that advanced breast cancer should be treated with bone marrow transplants. Now, these were top experts, I mean, big names. Everybody knew them in the medical field. So when they said something like this, we all paid attention. I reported on them. I interviewed them. We did stories about the use of bone marrow transplants for advanced breast cancer. Very understandably and predictably, more and more women and their families started demanding this treatment. Top experts were recommending it. Why wouldn't they? And if their insurance companies didn't want to pay for it, they would sue the companies, multi-million dollar suits. This went on for about seven years until finally in 1999 at the annual meeting of the major cancer organization in this country, the ASCO meetings we call them, American Society of Clinical Oncologists, they presented three double-blind studies that showed definitively, without question, that bone marrow transplant for advanced breast cancer was no better than regular chemotherapy. And we stopped doing it almost overnight because we finally had the scientific studies. But in the meantime, for about seven years, we had treated hundreds of thousands of women with this much more costly, much more dangerous, much more difficult treatment for no benefit. And I'm here to tell you that we do that all the time. We do new tests, new products, new devices, new drugs without fully testing them. And then as we start accumulating experience and finally doing the studies, we find out that they're not all what they were cracked up to be. We withdraw drugs. You know, that happens all the time because of side effects that we learn about when we start using them in more widespread fashion. So we've got this issue of spending a lot of money on stuff that maybe really we shouldn't be spending it on. And that's at the heart of the problem that we have to start thinking about when it comes to American health care. So 
the next chapter is called The Big Problem, and I've come to believe that at least part of the problem, maybe a major part of the problem, are the unrealistic expectations that all of us have as American healthcare consumers, and I include myself in this. So here's a bunch of C words that I think probably describes the way most Americans feel about what they want from their health care. Uh, we want health care that's convenient. When we think we're sick, we want an appointment right away, this afternoon, possible, free parking please, thrown in. We Americans, uh, we, we are sort of addicted to convenience when it comes to life in general, and certainly when it comes to health care. We want care that's compassionate, communicative, coordinated. Who wouldn't want that kind of care? I mean, that's, that's good stuff, and it's important that our health care have those qualities, but it takes a lot of people to do that, and that costs a lot of money. Maybe most significantly, we want health care, as I've just alluded to, that's on the cutting edge. We Americans have come to believe that the newest, the latest, is automatically the best. So we want what we heard on the evening news last night or what we read in the paper this morning if we have a problem, don't we? I mean, I'm being honest here. Don't you think that's the way we think typically, most of us? And ultimately, we Americans also want our health care to be cheap or even cost-free. We want somebody else to pay for it. Come on. We, we wanted our employers to pay for it when they used to do that. Uh, we want government to pay for it if we can't afford it. We, we don't like the idea of paying for something we didn't want in the first place. I mean, who wanted to get sick? And then you have to pay for it? Come on. That's not fair. So when our co-pays go up from 10 to $25, we scream a little bit, moan and groan. This is a formula that, that doesn't work. You can't have all of that without paying the cost. And so we have got to start looking at ourselves as consumers in terms of our expectations and be willing to think more thoughtfully and rigorously about what it is we really do need and should have. Here are the six big drivers of healthcare costs. These are the elements that keep pushing up costs. I'm going to, for purposes of simplicity tonight, I'm going to lump the first three together. Doctors, hospitals, drug and device companies. Because traditionally, all of these have been paid for on what we usually call the fee-for-service model, meaning we simply pay for doing. So the more the doctors or hospitals do, the more devices we use or drugs we use, the more we get paid. Uh, basically, what we say to the healthcare industry in general is, the more you do, the more you make. That's the fee-for-service model. You pay by name, by procedure. That's why all these offices and hospitals spend so much time coding what they do so the insurance companies will pay for it. But that really pushes the button to do more without always thinking about whether or not it's really necessary. So everybody agrees that if we're going to have true reform, we've got to figure out a different way to pay for health care. We've got to start figuring out how we can pay for outcomes and results rather than simply doing whether or not we need it. Now that's a huge culture change, believe me, I know as a physician, huge culture change. But there are a lot of people and places starting to work on this, uh, various methods of this, and I talk about that in the book in a little more detail. For example, something called global payment is becoming more popular in certain insurance plans now, where they say, given your age, your gender, and a profile based on 80 medical conditions, we're going to pay your doctor and hospital a set sum of money to take care of you for the year. And if they can do it more cheaply and still meet quality standards, which have to be a part of this, of course, they can make a little money. If they don't do it wisely and thoughtfully, they may lose some money. So that's one way people are trying to figure out how to pay for results and outcomes rather than simply automatically pay for doing. But somehow, we have got to figure out how to change our payment mentality for these big drivers of healthcare costs. Insurers are really middlemen in this whole process. Uh, they're caught increasingly between a rock and a hard place. Uh, the rock on the one hand of our demands as consumers, we want more and more coverage for less and less money, or at least we want no increase in our premiums for the same coverage. And the providers on the other hand who want more and more payment for their services. So the insurers are really getting squeezed and 
quite frankly, eventually probably will be squeezed out of business because the inflation rate for health care in this country for the last 10 years has been two to three times the general inflation rate. So you got health care going like this and general inflation going like this. Can't go on that way. Uh, we're heading for absolute financial disaster if we don't figure out how to get control of our health care costs. We're going to reach a point where we are facing national bankruptcy, where we can't sell our bonds in the international market because of our debt. And the major driver of debt, everybody agrees, is going to be health care costs. So we've got to figure out a better way to pay for health care. And the insurers are increasingly going to get caught in the middle and, as I said, probably eventually put out of business. Malpractice is an absolute mess in this country. It's immoral. It's inefficient. As we all know, a few people with dramatic stories and a sympathetic juror, jury get huge awards and the vast majority of people who are injured by modern medical care, whether it's malpractice or not, get nothing, absolutely nothing. Almost all other developed countries have gone to a no-fault system where we try to figure out with experts, not with juries and stories, what really happened and what people need to be compensated so they can survive and live decently uh, without all of the added costs of the present malpractice system. Unfortunately, the Democratic Party has been beholden to the legal industry in this country. That's going to have to change. We all know it. Everybody knows it. It's just a matter of time when the financial pressure is on, and that will change. And this last one, I want to say it hits close to home because I know that we in the media have fed this voracious appetite for more and more technology, for more and more new things that are not proven to be effective. And I gave you the example of the breast cancer treatment in the 1990s. Uh, a dramatic example that, as I said, opened my eyes and alerted me to this huge problem. All right, the big fear. So I'm going to take this on directly now. Uh, the big fear in this country when it comes to health care is fear of the role of the federal government. We all know that. We know that politicians, I would say, take advantage of that fear, understandable fear. We, we ought to worry about the role of government in everything we do, and especially in health care. So let me ask you to think about an industry in this country that is intensely private, very competitive in the free marketplace, but under the heavy regulation of the government to the benefit of us all. What would that be? Hmm? Airlines, think about it. Now, t uh, be honest with me here. Aren't you glad when you get on a plane at O'Hare that the federal government sets the standards? Those planes have to be inspected, whatever it is, every six months, and those pilots have to be recertified, whatever it is, every three months? Th that we don't leave that up to the states? I mean, what if you were flying into Mississippi? <laughs> And you had to wonder, you know, how they were regulating planes and pilots or any other state. Don't you like that idea? And that's why the safety record is so unbelievably good in the airline industry. We don't have that in medicine. We don't have any standard federal regulations. We leave it up to states, individual hospitals, and that's why the Institute of Medicine tells us a very unbiased body, highly respected, that there are approximately 100,000 deaths every year in this country from medical errors. 100,000. Why don't we get excited? Well, it's not like planes crashing from the sky. These deaths happen one by one behind closed doors, behind closed curtains. We don't know about it. We aren't aware of it. But the people who study it say it's a terrible problem because we don't have firm, set federal requirements for safety in this country. So I'm here to tell you, whether you want to hear it or not, that there may be a proper role for the federal government in health care in setting the stage, in setting the framework within which we can have a very competitive environment. We actually, airline industry, have another example 
of the federal government involved in health care. It's called the Federal Employees Health Benefits Program. This is the insurance program for federal employees and their families, current and retired, serves about eight to nine million people. It's also known as the congressional plan because it's what members of Congress have. Same thing. They're part of the Federal Employees Health Benefits Program, as are the Supreme Court justices and the president, anybody who works for the federal government. So how does it work? Well, what happens is, do we have any federal employees in the audience tonight who are part of this program? I'm curious. So you know how it works. Uh, every year you get a list of choices, right? Uh, for your geographical area. Uh, how many choices do you have in the list you get every year? Long, long list. Yeah. But they try to describe them in a way that you're comparing apples and apples. Uh, now, that's a huge number of choices compared to what most people get in the federal employee program. That's a really huge number because you're living in Chicago, I guess, and a lot of choices. Um, but basically what these people get is a list of insurance companies. They try to explain it in plain language. They have to all use the same comparison forms, and in most of them, you get feedback from other employees who have used programs, so you can see how they did, and if you don't like your program, you can change it every year, right? Yeah, we'll see you again. Hmm? Yeah, every November. I didn't. Once, once a year. Once a year. So if you don't like the way it was, you can pick a new one. Go to a worse one. Go to a worse one. <laughs> but you have choice at least once a year. Oh, yeah, no, I mean, and that's why you try to learn from the experience. By and large, the surveys of federal employees show they're very favorable toward this program compared to people who have to go out on their own and try to pick a program. This, this is called an exchange. That's what it is, an insurance exchange. And that's at the heart of the Obama proposal, by the way. Each state is supposed to set up an exchange for its citizens, for insurance companies to choose. Whether or not it will work, whether or not the states will do it in a way that makes sense remains to be seen. I would personally prefer that the federal government set the rules just like they do for the Federal Employees Health Benefits Program, no matter where you live, same rules, basically. Uh, but that's one way of doing it. Now, the German healthcare system is another way of doing it. This is a very capitalistic free market country, the biggest economy in Europe by far, Germany. What they do is they have 170 private nonprofit insurance companies. They call them sickness funds. That's a pretty sick name for an insurance company. But that's what they happen to call them. And in this case, the government sets the rate for what these insurance companies will get paid for a given person based on their medical profile. So the companies don't compete on the basis of price. They compete on the basis of service. They all get the same amount, but they try to give you better service. And again, every year, the Germans get to choose. If they didn't like their company, didn't treat them well, they choose another one. So it's very competitive, but on the basis of service. Kind of an interesting idea. Their costs are uh, almost a half of what ours, and their outcomes are just as good. We actually have one example of true socialized medicine in this country. It's called the VA system. I mean, if I wanted to write a provocative headline, but true, I could say, federal government <coughs> supports socialized medicine for our veterans. It's true. I mean, the government owns and operates this system. Doctors work for the government. It used to be a terrible system when I was in medical school, terrible. But in the early 1990s, a group of doctors in the VA system said, this is, we gotta change this. They developed a computerized system for healthcare that has become a model for the whole, whole world so that somebody who's in the VA, anybody in the VA system here? Well, my father is. Your father. So he gets his medical record no matter where he goes. They can pull it up instantly. They know everything about him, his medications. Overall, the surveys among veterans are very favorable. Not perfect. Nothing's perfect. But they provide quality health care at a much lower per person cost than the private health insurance industry in this country. And do you hear any members of Congress who might not get rid of the VA system? Have you heard anybody on either side of the aisle say that? Of course not. The veterans would rise up in protest. So all I'm trying to say to you is don't automatically think government is the wrong way to go 
in everything in every way. I think there is a role for the federal government. We just got to figure out what that role is and how we can make it work and still allow for competition and innovation. Okay, the big sermon. Are you ready? <laughs> the best estimate is that 45,000 people die every year in this country because they don't have health insurance. How can you be pro-life and live with that? Come on. I mean, really, in the, the richest country in the world? There's something wrong with that. I don't care what your political persuasion is. That's just not right. The parable of the Good Samaritan. Let me read it for you. There once was a man who was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when robbers attacked him, stripped him, and beat him up, leaving him half dead. It so happened that a priest was going down that road, but when he saw the man, he walked by on the other side. In the same way, a Levite also came there, went over and looked at the man, and then walked by on the other side. But a Samaritan, and by the way, Jesus picking a Samaritan as the hero of this parable was very interesting, because Samaritans were then and now pretty much outcasts among Jewish society. But a Samaritan who was traveling that way came upon the man, and when he saw him, his heart was filled with pity. He went over to him, poured oil and wine on his wounds, and then bandaged them. Then he took him to an inn where he took care of him. The next day, he took out two silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper. Take care of him, he told the innkeeper, and when I come back this way, I will pay you whatever else you spend on him. And Jesus concluded, said to the lawyer who had asked the question, who is my neighbor? Jesus said, in your opinion, Mr. Lawyer, which one of these three acted like a neighbor toward the man attacked by the robbers? The teacher of the law answered, the one who was kind to him. Jesus replied, you go then and do the same. In 1810, two very prominent Boston physicians sent out a letter to the community saying, we want to raise money to build a hospital for people who can't pay, for poor people in our community. And in that letter they said, when in distress, every man becomes our neighbor. Now, they chose the word neighbor because they were pious Protestants who knew the parable of the Good Samaritan. They very deliberately picked that word neighbor in their letter. This was not an accident. When in distress, every man becomes our neighbor. Not, now, listen to this. Not only if he be of the household of faith, but even though his misfortunes have been induced by transgressing the rules of both reason and religion. I mean, here's what they're saying. If you get sick, we're going to take care of you. It, even if it's your own fault, even if you made terrible decisions, violated reason, even if you're not like us, member of the household of faith, if you're in distress, you're our neighbor. That letter resulted in the formation of the hospital I have been affiliated with all my life, the Mass General Hospital. Those words are engraved in the walls, the marble walls of the hospital, when in distress. What is the difference between health protection and police or fire protection? I mean, we, we don't withhold fire and police protection based on ability to pay or who you are, do we? Not, not often, but we do that all the time with health protection. I think it's immoral not to provide basic health care for everybody. And I think it makes terrible financial misfortune to do that because people without insurance often go instead to the emergency room for trivial care because they don't have anywhere else to go. It costs us a huge amount of money for something that could be taken care of very simply in a primary care setting if they had insurance, or they wait so long because they don't have insurance until they get really sick and then they go to the emergency room and now it's going to cost a fortune to take care of them. And the results are not going to be as good. I mean, I guess if, if we decided as a society to let people die on the streets, we could save money. Quite honestly, we could. But since we're going to take care of them, at least so far, that's, I mean, we don't let people die on the streets yet. 
since we're going to take care of them when they get sick enough, why not do it in a way that is cost efficient early on when it'll be more effective and much less costly? That's my point. So I think universal coverage is not only morally right, for those of us who claim to be followers of Jesus and have read that parable so many times, but I think it makes financial sense in the long run. It costs a little bit up front to get it going, but in the long run, I have no doubt that we could prove that it would save money. So the big prediction. No developed country will be able to do everything for everyone at every age that modern medical science might dream up. We have in this country what the editor of the New England Journal of Medicine in 1989 called the medical industrial complex, playing off of President Eisenhower's famous phrase about the military industrial complex. We have an industry in this country that pours out new technology, new devices, new drugs, new tests, and that gets matched up with our expectations to have the newest and the latest and the best. So we've got a kind of a formula for financial disaster brewing in this country. During the debate over the health care bill, there were eight there were eight lobbyists for every congressperson in Washington. Now, they weren't there to think about how to spend our money wisely. They were there thinking about how to preserve their little part of the honeypot. And I, I, I want to say that this is complicated. I don't mean to make it too simplistic. Because if we do real reform and get rid of the stuff that is really not medically sensible and necessary, there are going to be a lot of people's jobs affected. And that's a bad thing for honest people earning a living, paying taxes. It's a bad thing for our economy. I can understand, in a way, why politicians don't want to touch this for that reason alone. So if we're going to do this, we really have to do it carefully and thoughtfully over a period of time where we retrain people who are going to be displaced by health care reform into other jobs that are going to be needed in our society in health care. Physician assistants, nurse practitioners, home health care aides, people who work with the elderly if that population explodes, as we all know. To me, true health care reform has to have four elements. Otherwise, it's not going to really work. And these are the big four in my judgment. Number one, I've already talked about payment reform. We've got to figure out how to pay for results and outcomes instead of just pay for doing. Number two, we've got to have a national IT system like the VA has for its members so that your electronic record can go with you no matter where you go, when you change systems, change insurance plans, change cities, states, it'll go with you and you will not get lost in the process, as so often happens today. Once we have that in place, what we need are so-called comparative outcomes data. That is data that compares treatments to show what really works and what doesn't, what we should pay for and what we shouldn't pay for. Now, a lot of the drug and device companies fight this kind of research because they know their products aren't going to hold up under scrutiny. But it's the only thing that's going to allow us to make rational decisions rather than just go by what we've always done or what we believe we should have or what doctors were trained to do, whether or not it was really proven. And all of that has to happen ultimately in the setting of good primary care, what, what the experts today usually refer to as the medical home, meaning the place where you go when you think you're sick, available 24-7, at least by phone staffed by primary care doctors, nurse practitioners, physician assistants, where your records are kept, where when you need immunizations or screening, they automatically contact you, where most importantly, when you get sick with a complicated chronic disease, they coordinate the care with various specialists rather than you out there on your own trying to figure it out. All of that will make a huge difference in saving money and providing, more importantly, the right kind of care, what's needed, and avoiding what isn't needed. In my book, I tell the story of a woman whose husband had a severe stroke at age 74, I think it was, 
and was basically non-functional, just bed-bound 24 hours a day. And she tried her best to take care of me, got pneumonia, ended up in the hospital. Cardiologist she had never met marched in, said, well, your husband's got to have a pacemaker or he's going to die. And what is she going to say? Of course, yes. So he has a $20,000 procedure. But he's still bed-bound, lives another five years, finally dies, and they had to cut the pacemaker out so it wouldn't explode during cremation. That woman, if she'd had a doctor she trusted, or a physician assistant or nurse that she knew, that the family trusted and knew them, if that person had come in and said, you shouldn't do this. It's not going to make any difference in his life. It's going to cause him some side effects. It's going to cost a lot of money. She would have made a different decision. But she didn't have that kind of medical home available to her in her time of need. So we've got to figure out how to make this all work. Now, I'm pretty pessimistic, and I, I feel I have to be totally honest with you. I, I, I'm not given the political gridlock, and I'm blaming both sides for this, believe me. I, I mean, the politicians couldn't even agree on closing military bases, remember? They, they couldn't even agree on that, so they finally had to get an independent commission to make those hard choices for them. Well, this is going to be a lot worse. So the only way I think it can happen is with some kind of a national board of experts removed from the political process doing these kinds of reforms. But if that doesn't happen, the costs are going to keep going up. And somewhere between five and ten years from now, if they go up at the present rate of inflation, we're going to face bankruptcy. I mean, true national bankruptcy. And then my prediction would be that they'll call an emergency meeting in Washington like the banking crisis. Remember that big weekend meeting? And they'll probably decide to expand Medicare to cover everybody because that will give them the pipeline in one place to try to control the costs so they can become solvent again as a nation. I mean, that's honestly what I think is going to happen unless, by some miracle, we get some courageous politicians who are willing to compromise and talk to each other. The reason I hold out a little bit of hope that it could happen is because, believe it or not, it's happening in my state of Massachusetts. Romney Care, believe it or not, is working. He signed the bill six years ago. We now have almost universal coverage in our state, 98% of adults, 99.6% of children, we are bending the cost curve because of some very creative political solutions. We've got a governor who is not running for re-election. We've got leaders in both parties in the legislature who are civil and talking to each other. We've got heads of the major insurance companies, Blue Cross Blue Shield, Harvard Pilgrim, Tufts, who are thoughtful men and willing to sit down and compromise and talk, and they are all talking together. And they are coming up with some ideas that are starting to slow down the increase in costs in our state. The surveys in our state show that the overwhelming majority of citizens in Massachusetts approve of what's happened. You wouldn't pick that up from listening to the national media, would you? So one of the stories that needs to get told is what's happening in Massachusetts. It's possible if you've got the right people in the right way talking to each other to try to do some of these things. But whether or not we can pull it off on the national scene, I think, is very much up for grabs. And that's my honest, honest opinion. I feel like I've uh, really left you with a pain between the ears here, haven't I? <laughs> hmm? I, I? I feel like I need to apologize for that. But I, I wanted to be as honest as I can with you. Um, this is what I honestly have come to believe in what I think I have learned. And uh, I'd be happy now to take your questions or comments or disagreements and fire away at me. So please go to the microphone and ask what you want. Thank you, by the way, for your kind attention. Hi, Tim. Thanks for coming. Um, I wanted to present to you a couple real situations that have happened in my family in the last year that very directly relate to what you have talked about tonight. 
Uh, the first one that I can think of is um, a situation with a parent at a local hospital um, who was, um, I took to the emergency room, actually had a physician pull me aside in the ER and say, she's 80 years old. I'm not gonna do anything to treat her. I said, are you kidding me? You're not gonna do anything to treat her? She was having hallucinations, which as you know, the leading cause of that is a UTI, but could be other things. So as it turns out, I had to apply some pressure mm -hmm. from the outside, ended up getting some good treatment. However, the person next door and the person next door that were elderly were turned away because of their age and actually not given what might have even been very simple treatment. Um, the second thing I wanted to mention to you is I have um, had electronic records that even for myself, um, have been incorrectly um, inputted. And it has been virtually impossible for me to get it corrected because it has transferred from one doctor to another doctor, to a hospital, to a this, to a that. And I'm having a very difficult time actually getting the correct information put in that. So I question the validity of actually have, how that could benefit Thirdly, I want to I want to question you regarding the VA. Um, I don't I don't know how many people in the audience have actually had treatment at the VA. So my question for you is, my experience because I used to work in a hospital um, as a as a paraprofessional um, is that the treatment that was received in the VA was not was substandard mm. compared to the treatment that the same person could receive in a different hospital. So I guess I'd like to hear how you address those. Well, I'll take the last one and work backwards. Uh, okay. When it comes to the VA, obviously, as I said, no system is perfect. But the hard data that we have now collected for many years shows that overall the VA does a better job at a lower cost than the similar data from private health insurance in this country. <coughs> Pardon me? In terms of outcomes, uh, if, if you look at, the VA has more data on their patients than any other health system in the country because of their electronic records, which by the way, in the VA system work very, very well. Now, ultimately, to address your first your point about electronic records, whether it's paper or electronic, bad input means bad records, period. So the input has to be correct, no question about that. Uh, but if you can do it, in the right way, as many systems do. I'm part of a healthcare system called Partners in Boston, Mass General, Brigham and Women's. We have incredibly good medical records that have prevented all kinds of medication disasters and picked up things that we would have missed otherwise. No question about that in our experience. I can't defend every electronic record system in the country because one of the problems is that there's so many different ones now because we don't have a national standard that some are definitely subpar, and that may be the case in your, the ones they're using for you. So I'm not here to say that they're all perfect by any means. Um, but if we can figure out how to do it right in terms of a national standard that everybody can use when they transfer records and get the right input, uh, I have no doubt that it can make a big difference because we've seen it happen in systems that do it. The Mayo Clinic, for example, has used electronic records for many, many years, very successfully. Um, my system, the partner system, the guys in there are all kinds of examples, but unfortunately they don't communicate with each other. So if you move from one to the other or travel from one to the other, they don't work. The problem of treating the patient, obviously, I can't speak to that. I wasn't there. What I will say is that if you had had the kind of medical home that we would like to see everybody had so that you didn't have to deal with a strange doctor in the emergency room, but you would be dealing right away in that setting with the people that you knew or that your mother or father knew uh, and had the records for and understood, that shouldn't happen. And it wouldn't happen in those settings. Yeah. And they said that was what we are doesn't say anything about age. I hate to tell you that, but it doesn't. That was a bad doctor making a bad decision from what you seem to describe. Uh, and I will tell you that the doctors that I know and work with in Boston 
would never do something like that for that person. That's all I can tell you. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Johnson. Uh, we've lived in countries where there was universal health care like Great Britain, and six years over there we were taken care of very, very well. Why can't we do that here? Thanks for bringing some uh, sense into this discussion. Um, I was wondering, however, with the Obama health care uh, plan, uh, what provisions you see for cost containment? Because, as you say, this is really the rub. They're working on it in Massachusetts. Do you see adequate provisions in the new health care plan to rein that in? Not enough to be very short and sweet. Uh, no, I don't think there's enough in that. And by the way, there are many model projects that they're supporting, trying to show how things might work in terms of bending the cost curve. So that's a step in the right direction to try to gather some experience and data on various maneuvers to control costs. But I don't think there's enough in there to bend the cost curve. I think it's going to have to be more eventually based on the way we learn from some of these model projects. And who knows what the final result is going to be of that so-called Obamacare bill. I mean, it could be totally different by the time a new Congress, uh, maybe a new president takes over. So, you know, I'm reserving judgment until we get past the next election to see what we're really dealing with in terms of actual uh, provisions in a bill, because I think it'll be very different than what we have right now, quite frankly. Yes? I uh, want to say, first of all, how much I appreciate a number of the things that you said tonight, particularly uh, the application from the religious tradition uh, to the question of morality, which was the impulse, after all, for trying to have health care reform in the first place, which everybody pretty much seems to have forgotten mm -hmm. in the press uh, and in the political discussion, in fact. Uh, I guess my question to you is, it really is about the so-called Obamacare Affordable Care Act, and that is when you've, when you've talked about it, pretty much what you've said is you're reserving judgment. For sure. Uh, and I guess what, where it leaves me with a sort of gap, though, is there is a bill that, if its provisions are left in place, uh, within a few years at least has the potential to provide health care coverage to 20-some to 30-some million people. And I haven't heard you describe that as in any sense in advance. I would think from the moral perspective, it's some advance, uh, but uh, I'd be interested in your uh, I do take absolutely on that. believe that any time we can increase coverage, it's a moral advance. What I worry about, of course, is how we're going to pay for it. And we should all worry about that. Um, I do believe that if we can do it in the right way, over the long run, we'll actually save money compared to leaving people on their own to seek expensive emergency room care instead. Much better to provide it in the medical home primary care setting. So I'm looking for what will happen uh, eventually with that bill or whatever replaces it at some point in the future. But as I've told you, I'm pretty pessimistic that we're going to control costs in this country, no matter what we do or don't do, because the drivers for costs that I described are so intense and pervasive in our society that I think it's going to be very difficult. I wish I could be more optimistic. Yes. Dr. Johnson, thank you so much for your comments tonight, for your work and your wonderful testimony. Uh, through your work, uh, through n a number of decades. We really appreciate that. Uh, in your opening remarks, you alluded to the fact that we could have reform and also free enterprise, and that the two could work together. I'm most interested in that prophetic voice that you might carry, and uh, wonder how you're thinking about the creativity that you mentioned where these could come together in a very wholesome way to provide health care that is fair and equitable for all. Well, the reason I, I'm potentially optimistic about that possibility is that there are many other developed capitalistic countries that are doing it in one way or another. I briefly described the German model, where the competition is at the level of service, but that's a very important kind of competition. So I applaud that. They do instead control costs by having the prices set and have the competition on the service basis. Uh, Switzerland, for example, uh, another country uh, that has a private public model, which is the way we usually refer to it. I think it's entirely possible to do that if, if we had a political climate where people could sit down and really think this through and compromise without all of the political cliches that we now have. That's what makes me pessimistic about it. Yes. 
I am a physician, and uh, um, I have practiced in this vicinity for approximately 48 years. Mm. Uh, I have also practiced in the Belgian Congo, well, the Zaire, it was called. Zaire, yes. Uh, I much prefer the uh, United States medicine than Zaire I would too. medicine. <laughs> yeah. um, for all kinds of reasons. For many reasons. <laughs> right. Um, and I, I read in the press about how the hospitals in such and such a country treated something so and so, and it's entirely false, because yeah. there is no hospital there at all. Um, but uh, my, my problem, uh, and has been through the years, is why do I pay uh, so much money to protect myself against the very people I'm doing my best to help? Uh, I'm an obstetrician, gynecologist. The worst. Yes. <laughs> yes. I mean, really, not, we not all know the that. Worst, not the worst employment. No, worst but the malpractice. worst malpractice. Absolutely. Uh, uh, I wasn't year, saying that facetiously. One year I paid $108,000 yeah. to protect myself right. against uh, litigation. Right. And the, the lawyers, of course, don't want to abolish that. That's right. They want my $108,000. That's right. Okay. Um, As do the medical insurers. Of they're course. Making, they're making of course. money. Oh, they're making great money out of it. Yeah. Uh, so that's one thing that I think has to be changed. Yeah. And I don't think Obama's law does much to change it. Not much. No, Not much. I, I criticize the Democrats for that, yes. as you remember. No well, question. And the Republicans, too. I mean, well, they're not doing a lot either, yeah. but the Democrats no. have protected the legal lobby in this country too yeah. long. Um, the other thing, when you talk about... Uh, uh, Sorry to any lawyers in the audience, by the way. Yeah, I apologize, lawyers. When you talk about the, the cost of uh, medical care in the end of life, which consumes a huge percentage of it. Right. The last six months of life right. in this country consumes a huge amount of money. Uh, personally, I don't care <clears throat> if my tombstone says I died on October the 1st or October the 15th. That makes no difference. I criticize my peers who do all they can to prolong life for another day or Actually, two or to three. prolong the dying process. Exactly, exactly. We're not prolonging uh, real life, we're prolonging the dying process too often, not yeah. always. And I, I apologize to any other surgeon that's here, but you know, if an if a 80 year old person comes in with a bowel obstruction and they operate on them and they live the next day, they have succeeded. Mm -hmm. And that is wrong. I think that, that we should allow people who are going to die to die and to die with dignity. And usually, my, my opinion, is to die with their family. Or in a hospice setting. Or a hospice setting, but, but not in a hospital with tubes and right. both arms. And, and, and by the way, as you probably know, the polls show now clearly that most Americans don't want to die that way, you know, in a hospital with 12 tubes coming out. Exactly. Of That's not the exactly. debate. The debate is how to get the counsel and wisdom right. they need at that time. Right. So I think I think you listed you listed the uh, six big drives drivers yeah. of healthcare costs, yeah. and number one was doctors. Uh, In terms of the decision making process, we're the ones who decide to order what exactly, yeah. and that's where I that's where I uh, uh, oppose my peers. Uh, philosophy that you know you, you pile on more and more medications and more and more uh, tests and more and more treatments when you know that the outcome I mean only God knows when we're going to die but you, doctors have a way of predicting you're going to live for two more months or two more months, uh, years yeah. or whatever and that's wrong uh, you should allow them to die with dignity when God takes them without all this excessive stuff thank My you for secret. your comments all right yes please We'll do a couple more. We got two, and then I, uh, we'll do three. And then we'll call it a night. Thank you again for your presentation. I really appreciate um, the areas that you see as needing to have some real reform. Um, but I wonder if some of our costs in this country are not just related to the care that we're getting, but the lives that we're living. We're facing, you know, some 30 to 35 percent of our kindergartners are, are going to school obese. They're going to be spending health care dollars. Um, if we don't address uh, keeping people out of the system, how can we control costs? And how, how do, is yeah. that a health care 
Yeah. Is that a government? Where does that fit into the role? It, it's tricky, obviously, changing lifestyles. Uh, I'm all for insurance differentials. For example, people who smoke, I think, should pay more uh, as an obvious one. Uh, and I think we're going to have to more and more have financial incentives for changing our lifestyles. Um, and many workplaces are doing that now in terms of the way they provide insurance at different levels of cost. So we've got, clearly got to address it. Now, here, you know, if we think that prevention, for example, is the answer to everything, what I worry about, and, and I'm not trying to be facetious when I say this, what if we get so good at prevention that everybody lives to 90 and gets Alzheimer's disease? <laughs> I mean, seriously, you know, that's a huge issue in our society right now. And so we've got to be addressing how we're going to treat the benefits of good prevention, too. Okay, here and back here, and then yes. we're done. Thank you, Dr. Johnson. Um, I'd like to ask a question. Um, I've heard some concern. That in the intermediate term, um, it might be cheaper for employers to pay penalties and fines. Right then provide ins health insurance. Right. Uh, would you discuss no, that? No, I think that given the current way it's written, that, that is something we should worry about, and we've got to figure out how to prevent that from happening. Now, if in the long run people can buy better insurance at a better price that way, okay. And if we take away the tax benefit and give the people direct money to buy insurance, as long as it's uh, in an exchange that they can understand and make good choices from, that may be the way to go. I, we're going to be doing all kinds of things in the next five years in this country that some are going to work, some aren't. We're going to experiment. I just hope we can do enough in a short enough period of time to fend off the financial disaster that's coming. Don. I'd like to draw you out a little bit on number four. Yep. Primary care and medical home. You have written and, and said that I think our split in this country between Primary care, physicians and specialists is about 30, 70. Right now. Heading for 2080. Exactly. And that there are countries, industrialized countries, where the split is about half and half. Almost all other countries. But this is going to require some change in that ratio. And how do you do that? And how would you, how do you move in that direction even? Well, I'll tell you what some other countries have done. Yeah. Number one, they have eliminated the cost of medical school so that doctors come out without any debt and can make choices based on what they want to do rather than what they have to do financially to pay off their debt. That's a huge thing, and it works. And we've proven that in other countries. So that would be my first step. Secondly, we've got to make working conditions for primary care doctors uh, more or less equivalent to specialists. And we do that by providing the medical home with the kind of assistance that makes it a tolerable life with nurse practitioners and physician assistants. So we've got to emphasize that. Uh, those two things alone, I think, would there are a lot of kids coming out of medical school who really would like to become family doctors, but don't because they got huge debts that they feel right. they got to pay off, and they don't like the working conditions in terms of the long hours, the weekends. So we got to provide better working conditions. But the incomes of the specialists are higher. They in, are higher, general, and yeah. and they w will always be somewhat higher, and right. probably should be somewhat higher because they put in additional three to five years of training, but they don't have to be two, three, four times as much. Thanks. Last question. Hi, Dr. Johnson. I have two quick questions. Okay. Uh, the first one is how would you address illegal immigration in this reform? Oh. As an Arizona resident, I know that in both Arizona and California, a lot of um, hospital ERs have closed due to bankruptcy, and yeah. I was just wondering how you would address that. Yeah. Uh, I'm no expert on immigration per se, uh, and clearly we've got to get control of that problem, and I'm going to have to leave that to other people. I mean, I simply... I'm not smart enough to figure that one out. What I will say is that in the meantime, if they show up, I'm going to take care of them. I'm not going to let them die. That's what I will do as a physician. The political system is going to have to solve the immigration problem. We can't ask the medical system to solve that. Mm -hmm. And then the second part of my question, uh, with this reform, how would you recommend that we pay for it with or without tax reform? Oh. Again, you're talking, <laughs> simple little question. And again, I, I, I'm honestly not trying to evade it, but I'm telling the truth. I'm not an expert on tax reform. But I listened to Simpson Bowles, the two of them the other night on a program. Boy, did they make a lot of sense to me, those two guys. Uh, one a Republican, one a Democrat, you know, in terms of, we got to have both. I mean, we got to have, we got to cut spending, no question about it, but we got to raise revenue too. Uh, I just don't see how you can do it without that kind of compromise. But 
I'm not an expert. Thank you again. I appreciate it.